Okay, so welcome back for the second session. And we'll go back to the slideshow here. I think that'll bring that up. Uh, just so you know, I'll just bring up the, the first slide here. So this is the 9th of, uh, sorry, the 22nd of September. And I will go through the the Greek. Now this is actually considered the Greek 109 lessons. I, I haven't set you up any homework at this point yet. I think it, it's important at this stage that we'll just make sure that you, you can understand the, the um, you know, the concepts that we've done. The last of the homework you had was from, let me just check this, I think it was lesson, at the end of uh, lesson, the end of lesson five, so exercise 59 it was, and I understand that you're doing the, uh, the, um, the even numbers for that. And had some tests back, so a lot of a lot of you seem to be doing okay. You've actually improved a lot. That you were getting stuck with the articles, so and this lesson will focus on the articles, and then there's some other uh, concepts which we can bring out about the cases. Uh, now with the articles, if you go into the the notes that I've sent you, the PDF notes, which is actually from the book, the New Inter uh, New Testament Greek for Beginners by Machen. If you go to the back of the book, there's a whole lot of indexes there. And in the indexes there, there's a list here that you see of the articles. Now the articles are very helpful. They'll appear with the nouns in the lexicon. So if you have the Greek lexicon, and when I come over in, um, at the end of next month, I'm going to bring a lexicon with me, uh, and we can make photocopies of that for everybody. Um, but when it gives you the, the nouns, it'll give you the, uh, the nominative case form for that noun. And that helps you to understand how the rest of the noun forms. Uh, now you've learned already about the cases. And remember the cases only apply to nouns, not the verbs. So when we talk about case, what we're really talking about is the, the role of the noun in a sentence. And just like in English, English is a bit more basic, but you have the, the nouns performing the role of the subject or the object, or you have the indirect object as well. Okay, uh, but with the Greek, you and you have to go back through the notes so you can, if you want, you know, sort of more detailed information. I've talked about this before, uh, but you have the nominative, N is the nominative noun, so that's really the, the subject, the main subject of the sentence. You have the genitive. It takes on a few different roles, but for now, the important thing we, we use in, the, in our examples is the genitive explains the role of possession. Uh, and what you have to remember is that the genitive uh, form will appear on the noun, which is the possessor of the thing that's being formed. So, for example, you have like the word of God. The word would be, um, you know, and it's the subject. We're talking about the, the subject of the sentence. Uh, and the word is ho and logos. Remember, ho logos is the word. And then of God, the word for God in the nominative or subject, if God was a subject, that would be ho theos. Okay, so both of these words I've given to you now in the nominative form as a subject. So if we're talking about, you know, the word is whole logos, and, and the word for God, if you looked in a lexicon, would be whole theos. But because it's the word, the word, and this is the subject we're talking about, we're talking about like the word of God is good, for example. Uh, but just looking at the word, he is the subject. He's the main thing we're talking about in the sentence. So this is whole logos. But when we say of God, now the word of God God is the possessor, really. He, he's the, the, the one that owns the word of God or the one that, you know, he, he produced the word of God. So it's like it's his word. So the word God is going to show who is the possessor. And it's in the genitive. So there you'd have, instead of whole logos, we would say tu theu. So he changes from you know, being the subject of the sentence to the genitive showing the possessor. So again, just that simple phrase, the word of God, like we say, the word of God is alive and powerful. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, ho logos tu theu, the word of God. Um, 
And so when you see it in the English, you know, of God, then, then we, we would know that that's genitive. We're talking about of God, that's from him. Uh, but when you see, for example, the noun in the Greek form, like to theou, you say, okay, this is talking about God, and it's in the genitive, so you say of God or belonging to God. So the, the, it's not the, you know, the word logos or the word word doesn't take the genitive form, but the one that possesses, the one that is the owner, he's the one that's in the genitive form, not the thing being owned, as it were. Okay, so, uh, but that, that, that's masculine because the word logos and theos, they are masculine words. You also have for the feminine. So, hey agape, for example, the word for love, that's in the feminine form. Uh, so, you know, you have the love of God, that would be hey agape to theu. And then you have a neuter form. Um, I think the word of faith, for example, that's that's in a, in a neuter. So it's pistis. It takes on a different form altogether. Uh, but in that case, you'd say, you know, we, we don't really talk about the faith of God. But if you did, you'd say tol pistis uh, and then tu theu for that. Okay. Um, so anyway, he, he, yeah, the, the articles would take on the, the form of it's a masculine noun or a feminine noun or a neuter noun. It's got to have the right article form. And just knowing the articles, and you know, when you look at this chart here, you've got the four cases. Well, there's actually five because you got, remember the vocative. And the vocative is like when you're calling somebody, but that's going to take on the, uh, it takes on the nominative, the same nominative ending. So that's why they don't have it here. Uh, so you've got four articles to remember for the masculine and the singular, and then four for the um, for the plural. Um, and I'm just thinking with the the neuter form. I think the neuter is the same because I haven't got it in the plural. I, I believe it's the same in the singular and the plural. Uh, that sounds right. I have to check that actually. Um, now let me just do that now because it's, it's either the same in the neuter or it takes on the masculine form. And I should have remembered that because it's been a while since I've seen some examples of that. Let me just check here. 2.30. Oh, it doesn't tell us. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll have to get back to you on that. But it, it, it's either going to take the same, the, the plural nominative, uh, plural neuter takes the same form as the singular or the masculine. I'll, I'll just have to check back which one it is. Okay, so with the uh, the masculine form ho to to ton, and the last two word, the last two letters that forms the ending of the noun as well. So you have to do like. So is there a question there? I think the slides not moving. The slides. The slides has, hasn't moved. Are you still on this? Oh. Oh, sorry about that. Thank you very much for telling me. Okay, I thought I had that. Uh, oh, goodness. Okay. Um, yeah, why is that not moving? Um, maybe I need to share this again. Let me just try again. Okay. I think, oh, you can see it now. Okay. Sorry about that. I, I, I clicked on the wrong button and it was showing me an old screen. Ah. Okay. Um, ne next time, if anybody suspects that I haven't, if the screen should be there and it hasn't, then, then make sure you tell me fairly quickly so that I can um, I can adjust. Okay. Because yeah, sometimes it shows up the wrong one. Okay. Uh, yeah, it depends on what's showing on my screen and what you're seeing. It was different there. Okay. So just uh, quickly, thank you for telling me. By the way. Um, so quickly to go back again in the masculine form. Okay. You have ho. And if it was the word logos, like I gave you the examples, like whole logos, to logu, to logo, ton, logon. And you see the endings are always going to match. Uh, for the feminine, like we had the word agape or agapes, agape, agape. Uh, and then you have the word uh, and the neuter. Uh, so we had the word, uh, what's the neuter now that we have? Um, and let me just check because. Should have some examples, but we've got the examples all here. Oh, Doron, for example, ah, that's not Doron. Yeah, to, where's an example of a neuter word? 
Okay, oh, sorry, so I had the word Doron. That's, that's a gift. Oh, and in that case, the, the endings differ. Okay, and the, the feminine is the same, but with the, uh, the nominative endings, because, why is it, to, to, do, ron, um, and that's in the, that's in the neuter. <laughs> okay, let me just check this out. I've got, got some examples here. Oh, that's from a gift. Okay. Um, yeah, so it's just for that first, for the first one, and the, the nominative, uh, that's the subject for the word Doron. So, to Doron, and it comes back to taking on the same endings. To Doru, which would mean of the gift. To Doro, which would be uh, towards the gift. And To Doro, uh, Doron again. And the neuter, the, the nominative, and the accusative are the same. And so you get all these different, um, what do you call these, um, idiosyncrasies. And sometimes they don't exactly match up. Uh, and that's just going to have to come through memory. Or you, again, you check on the software. Uh, and that's generally how I think you know, most people do it these days. There's very few people that would read Greek fluently. Um, it's interesting, yeah. You know, even when I, when I meet a lot of pastors in the church here and, and anywhere, and then they say they've, they've studied Greek, but uh, it might have just been one or two very basic courses. And uh, yeah, so t to become very scholarly, of course, would mean that you'd have to remember all of the, or every form. Uh, and there's only a very few number of people that would do that. Uh, okay, so and, and the forms again, and the masculine, so the Articles and remember the article is only the definite article. Definite article is when you have the word the. So again, I gave the example going back to here. Ho logos, we'd say the word. If you didn't have the word ho there, then you'd just say word or a word, a word of God, which would then be logos to theo, a word of God. Okay, so you don't have the article in the Greek. Oh, sorry, if you don't have the article in the Greek when you're reading a Greek sentence, then we just translate that as a, uh, usually, or you don't have an article at all, but then the context will tell you. Uh, so the endings here we have, uh, so for example, and we've seen like the word man, anthropos in the singular, and the plural would be anthropoi for men, but if you had the man, then you say hoi, Anthropoi, and the word anthropos, you take off the omicron sigma, and then you put on the ending here, omicron iota. So this is actually knowing the articles helps you to understand what the word endings that you're seeing and the nouns, and also for the adjectives, it's going to be the same for the adjectives. Now uh, it will tell you what the form is. Okay, so maybe if you, even if you just remember this chart on on page two hundred and thirty. And if you go through these, and if you can memorize these, memorize the endings, and that'll really help you get a good understanding of the, the cases of the nouns, and whether the nouns are in the nominative, the genitive, the dative, or the accusative form, and whether they're masculine, feminine, or neuter. And so to do that, you've only got to remember, of course, yeah, you've got these, um, these three lists here and there's four there so that's going to be 12 oh, sorry five so you've got 15 different articles to remember which will help you remember the, the endings okay so that's something uh, for you to, to think about there and again just to emphasize that if you don't see the article in the Greek then just translate it as a uh, or you take the article off uh, okay now moving on to something else here um, I found a couple of lessons um, I'll, I'll post these, I, I can't actually cut and paste off this at the moment, but what I'll do, I'll go onto the website of the first one, uh, just some very basic Greek concepts about uh, you know, what, what we've been doing in the earlier chapters. Um, there's another link here as well I'll send in, we won't look at this one today, uh, but some of you that want to do your autodidactic learning, which means your self-teaching learning from the internet, then uh, these are good resources I think. Uh, but I'll go on to the, there's one here I had a, um, I think if I bring this up, I go over to here, 
just make sure you can see this one. Okay, um, so this is a website here. Um, got to get rid of this thing here. Hang on, let me just. I'm floating. Okay, um, the, I can't go to the top of the website. Here we go. Okay, the website here is called. It's not even a proper name for it, but you can see it up here. It's uh, Evienia, I think, Koine Greek Blogspot. Again, I'll put the link in. Um, but I just like the way that this person was explaining things. Okay, now she starts off with noun cases on the normative. See, we're talking about you know, there's five cases. Some people work to what's called an eight case system, but it's in the Greek language, there's actually only five true cases. Uh, or case endings and then it depends how you define them and other people once you start to define them in other ways and you can have eight cases but there's still only five case endings however you look at it which is again the nominative the genitive the dative locative instrumental of means that's all in one uh, and then you have the accusative and the vocative okay but now this is just looking at the nominative and she starts off saying english is not a highly inflected language which means your noun endings aren't going to change a lot. And for that reason, native English spe uh, speakers, and for the Filipinos, I guess, often find noun cases confusing. So in the sentences, the dog sees the cat, and the cat sees the dog, we do not spell cat and dog differently. We understand which animal is the subject of the verb and which animal is doing the seeing, uh, only via the word order. See, it's exactly the same words, but the word order is going to tell us. Uh, and again, you change it around and the whole meaning changes completely. Greek, on the other hand, is a highly inflected language. So word order is flexible. We've seen that. And meaning, the meaning of the sentence comes from the use of different case endings and the role that they perform grammatically. So to read and understand a Greek sentence, you must be able to recognize the case form of each noun. And there are five cases in Koine Greek, the nominative, genitive, dative, accusative, and vocative. So they're using the five case system, which I think is always best. Uh, and today we'll start a look at the nominative case. So the nominative case is used for the subject of a sentence. And you're familiar with these words, I've had these words before. Ho, and there's actually, there should be a rough breather on the top of the, the, Omicron, uh, the Omicron here. Uh, and you can see it here, I guess, that it, it's sort of, uh, sorry, just here they put the comma at the top. <coughs> but we say, ho, apostolos, blepe, ton, profetang. Uh, and the word prophet here is actually appearing in the feminine form. Uh, now, so, ho, apostolos is in the nominative case because the apostle is the subject of the verb. He is doing the seeing. The word blepe, that's the verb. And remember, if you have epsilon iota at the end, i just go to that. Um, this is the third person singular. But the, the verb blepo is the sort of the base verb, which would mean I see. That would be with the omega. But here they put the epsilon iota on the end. So we know this is the third person. So it's, it's talking about it's not me, it's not you, it's this guy over here, the apostle, the third person. Ho apostolos blepe ton prophetane. And this is the prophet. You can see the article here. Okay. Uh, and then prophetane. Oh, sorry. So actually, it's interesting here that they've taken the nominative. Oh, sorry, that's the masculine article. Uh, the verb is, is feminine in form, actually, because you've got the eta nu here. Um, and I, I guess that's, that's sort of one of these, these funny verbs. It doesn't fit into the first declension properly. Okay. Um, so we have two clues indicating a nominative. Okay. For, first, the ho is the definite article in its masculine nominative singular form. And the word hos ending of apostolos also indicating the masculine nominative singular and we saw that on the chart that we just had and if the sentence was reversed you could say ho profot uh, prophetes blepe ton apostolon now it changes you say the prophet sees the apostle now he's actually changed the order but again you see that they've changed the ending 
you see that here, here it was profitain, that's the accusative being the object that's being seen, but now it becomes profitais. And here you have apostolos, omicron sigma, and that's changed, the ending has changed. Uh, so the form of the nouns used would not be the same. Instead, we would have ton instead of ho for the definite article and apostolon instead of apostolos for apostle. Um, now, the, I don't think they gave us an example. See, what they, they should have done for the example here is said, uh, you could say uh, ton apostolon blepe ho prophetes. And in that case, because the endings change, the order would be different. You know, so, but the, the meaning would still be that the prophet sees the apostle. Again, so now you could actually write this in any form. You could say ton apostolon blepe ho prophetes, or you could say blepe ho prophetes ton apostolon. The meaning is still going to be the same. The prophet sees the apostle. So what is the subject of this new sentence? Whole prophet taste, which is the prophet, and the word for prophet is now in the nominative case. So you have the nominative uh, pronoun, uh, sorry, nominative article, and then you have the the nominative case ending. Um, okay, so that's instead of the word for apostle, which is now in the accusative case. They say more on that later, but you should be familiar with the accusative. He's the one that's receiving the action, the one that's being seen in this case. Uh, notice that our first clue is the same. The definite article is always ho for masculine, <coughs> nominative singular, and the ending of the noun is different, ace instead of hos. Uh, and you can, you can read on the end of that as well, but that, that's pretty much all they're explaining. A very simple explanation. Uh, and I also think that you, know, you could have a look through this website as well. Uh, I'm not sure who the actual teacher is on this. There's no name given. It's just the, the, the website there. But uh, So you can check out the website for doing extra, uh, if you want to do some extra studies or just some review of the basic concepts we went through uh, with some good examples there. Okay, now what I'll do, I'll go back to the, oh, sorry. Uh, go back to our presentation here. Okay. Um, now, what I want to finish off with, because we're talking about Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 2, that's the, the new study that you're doing with the Max Klein sermon notes. Okay, and I just want to, I uh, probably should bring up my picture here. Okay, um, and I thought we'd just go through the first couple of verses of Matthew so that we can have some practical application, just looking at the, the scriptures in the Greek. Uh, and some basic concepts, which I think you should be able to understand based on the notes that we have so far. Okay, um, but I'll read through the Greek first, and then we'll just take a couple of sort of basic phrases out and, and see how well we can do with that. So it starts off here, tu de Iesu. Okay, we have the Yota and the Eta together, we sort of say Iesu. This is the word of Jesus, it's in the genitive form. If you see the genitive here, see it's a noun, n noun. Jesus uh, is a noun. He's you know, he's uh, he's a person. Uh, and then you have the GSM, genitive, singular, masculine. And because it's genitive, we say of. You see that uh, omicron upsilon ending. Uh, okay, so. And then actually, and you have the article here. So this is actually the Jesus and the Jesus. Um, but we don't say and the Jesus. We, we just disregard the article. You see this word de many, many times in scripture. They're translating it here as now, uh, which is a legitimate translation for de, but often we say just and, or it can be even but or after, something like that in, in, in some cases. Uh, you see it's a conjunction. Okay, so you can say and or now. <clears throat> and then uh, Jesus, is the Jesus, but again we just say Jesus. Uh, and then they're talking about the birth of Jesus. Okay. Uh, but yeah, I'll just read through. So, tu de Jesu genethentos Bethlehem. Bethlehem, you see the double epsilon here. Uh, so, epsilon, epsilon, say so eem, we say Bethlehem. But here they, um, you know, we translate it right, transliterate as Bethlehem. 
uh, the Hebrew word Beit Lechem, uh, Lechem, sorry. So Lechem is, is bread and Beit means house actually in, in the Hebrew, but they tra they transliterate into the Greek Bethlehem, that's Bethlehem obviously. Um, Tes Judaeus, so that's of Judea. En Hemerais Herodu, Herodu, that's Herod, of Herod. So you see the genitive ending again. In the days of, see, of Herod. The days belonging to Herod, we wouldn't normally say they belong to Herod, but in the days that Herod was. But in English, we just translate it literally. We say the days, Hamerais, this is the word, Hamera is the word for day. Here it's in the dative. Uh, why is it in the dative form? Because we have the word in. And, and often when you have a preposition, they use it with the dative form, or, or sometimes even the accusative or the nominate uh, or the genitive. It depends on the preposition being used. This is the word in. Uh, and it can depend on the meaning of the preposition they want to bring out. So the word in can appear with the dative, but it can also appear uh, with the genitive, I believe, and the accusative also as well. Uh, so, but this is in the days, literally in hemerais heredu, in the days, it's plural, okay, so not just one day, in the days, and in heredu of Herod. Uh, to basilios, we've had the word basilios, uh, basilius, that's right, the king, is nominative form, he's the subject. Uh, sorry, that's now, it's a genitive form. Oh, uh, in the days of Herod the king. Oh, okay, now notice here, because we're talking about Herod, the days of Herod. Herod is in the genitive, and when you have the adjectival noun describing who Herod is, they put that into the genitive as well. So Herod the king, if... Um, you know, I think these are what we call nouns in apposition. So that, you know, one noun is describing the other noun. You could say like, um, Tim the pastor. I say this, this book belongs to Tim the pastor. The book is nominative. It's my book of the pastor, um, of Pastor Tim, I guess. So the word pastor would be in the genitive. The word Tim would be in the genitive as well. Um, Okay, so in this case, they're saying he is the king uh, of, in the days of Herod, the king. So the word here, the king, is also in the genitive, as you see. Uh, and then we have the word behold, edu. You see this word a lot, behold, it means look. Look at what ha look what's happening, or pay attention to this. Mag uh, magoi, uh, this is from the, I think it actually might be a Parthian word, but they bring it in the Hebrew as Magi, or a Magi, I guess. Um, but the mag, Magoi is when you have the Magi, but literally it meant wise men. And in the English, actually, Magi, it comes to mean magician. You have the word magic from Magi, M-A-G-I. Um, these people were not magicians. Okay, but because they got into the sciences and they understood physics and they understood chemistry uh, and astrology, astronomy, things like, I shouldn't say astrology, but astronomy mainly, uh, they were historians as well and the scientists, mathematicians of their time. And for a lot of people, I guess, I maybe thought that was quite weird uh, that it was a little bit magical. But anyway, in the English, so we have the word magic, which comes from the word magi. Uh, but literally, I think, yeah, this is a good translation. We, we translate them as wise men, uh, scholarly men, academics, perhaps. And these were the people that uh, they had a lot of knowledge. They were the, the, the academics of their time. Uh, and when you go to the book of, I think it's Daniel chapter 2, verse 48, and I, I think Max talks about this in his notes, <clears throat> that Daniel is mentioned in the book of Daniel as being part of this faculty of the Magi. And that's how they got to hear about the prophecy of the star coming and why the Magi were coming from uh, from the word Anatolia, which means from the, the east, and why they were coming to Bethlehem, because they studied about the, the stars. They studied astronomy. And when they saw the right aligning of the stars in the sky, uh, and I've heard suggestions there's a comet that came across the sky at that particular time, and then the planet, it might have been um, Jupiter, or one of the planets was very bright in the star at that time. And when they aligned together, they aligned over Bethlehem. 
Uh, and this is what I learned from Pastor Joe Griffin. I mentioned in the first session about you know the, the year that Jesus was born. Uh, because of the software, he used what's called Stargazer software. Uh, Joe Griffin, and he became a bit like a magi. He was studying that, and he could tell us about the time of the star over Jerusalem, uh, over Bethlehem, at, at what particular time in history. Uh, okay, so anyway, that's. Uh, you know, it's an interesting side thing, but you have these wise people from. Apo is a, lit a preposition, it literally means uh, from. Uh, we have a few words in English like that, but apposition means like to, to be opposite or be away from, often. Uh, and they were coming from Anatolone, which we have the word Anatolia, that's the ancient word for Turkey actually, but it means the east, it literally means the east. Uh, Paragenonto, ace. Yelosoluma, okay, and this is the word for Jerusalem. Here, I think there's a rough breather over there. I think it was Jerusalem or Jerusalem, maybe. Uh, but anyway, this is the Greek form, Yerosoluma. Uh, that's the Greek form of Yerushalem, Shalem in uh, Hebrew. So they came from the east to Jerusalem. Uh, what I want to do, just to, to bring out a certain uh, particular part of the Greek here, <coughs> uh, let's look at this here. So here we have the magoi. You have this ending. This is the noun. So it's a noun, nominative, plural, masculine. We have the word like logos, logoi, anthropos, anthropoi, apostolos, apostoloi. Telling you that you know it's in the the neuter uh, sorry in the nominative plural masculine form. So these men, one one magi would be magos, and then so we have many men. Uh, people usually think there's three three wise men came because on the Christmas cards that's how they have the three wise men, and this is just sort of a a tradition that came about because when they give their gifts they give these three gifts. You have the gold and the myrrh. And uh, what do they call it? There's, there's something else that they give. Um, but those three gifts there. And so people sort of... Sorry, what was it? Frankincense. Yeah. Oh, incense, yeah. And, yeah they, they frankincense. Give, yeah. Oh, frankincense, that's right. <clears throat> so uh, gold and mirror and, and frankincense. Um, and, and they're all symbolic. They actually, they, they, I, I shouldn't be trivial about that. They're all very symbolic towards um, you know, the, the way that they provide for the Lord and what they mean. Uh, but people think that because there was three kinds of gift given, there was three men, and that's what you see on the Christmas cards. Uh, but actually, it's, they would have needed a big troop of people, and, and they would have had their servants. You know, the Magi were probably very wealthy people. Obviously, they had lots of very expensive gifts. Uh, so they would have had you know, a, a big people, and, and the colonel said you know, it could have been up to a hundred men and women in their camel train. You know, they had the different servants, people looking after the camels. They had to have a security on uh, entourage, their bodyguards as well, because carrying a lot of very expensive gifts through some very dangerous areas. Uh, and then you know, the, the magi themselves, there could have been ten or twenty or thirty people in the faculty that all wanted to go to Jerusalem. Uh, so it would have been a very big event. And of course, you know, when they came into Jerusalem, you have this long train of, of great, uh, you know, very well presented people. I think even after a long time through the desert, they probably looked very regal, very elegant as they came into Jerusalem. So it was a big event for that time. Okay, but so here we have the, the, the Magi. This is plural. Apo Anatolon, so from. Again, this is the preposition, and the, when you say from, in this case, the, the preposition apo appears in the, with the noun in the genitive form. So every preposition, when you get into studying about prepositions, remember prepositions show, show a place. So on, under, beside, over, on top of, from, toward, all of these words which are describing position, these are what we call prepositions. Uh, and, and different prepositions are going to have their uh, you know, appear with the noun because when you're talking about a preposition, you're going to be talking usually about a place, so that place takes on the noun form. And the noun form is going to take on one of the cases. 
depending on the, the verb and depending on the, the motion described in the preposition. Okay, but that's another subject for another day, but just so that you understand that the prepositions, uh, they're going to be attached to a noun, and the noun is going to have, have to have a separate case. Okay, and again, you'll have to learn those later. Uh, now we have the verb. So but basically, if we just said magi came, now here we, we know it's a verb because it says V, second aorist, and D is deponent, and deponent usually takes on the... Um, but I can take on the form of what we call the middle voice and, and a verb. Remember, the verbs are talking about tense, which means the time, so past, present, future, and there's variations on that. Um, so aorist is a kind of a tense. Usually they translate it in a past tense. So here we have the, the verb here, came. They came, and that's a past tense. Uh, deponent would uh, normally, in the, the middle part we don't have another verb here uh, but the verbs also talk about the <coughs> excuse me about the voice uh, you have active voice the subject is doing the action you have the passive voice the subject is receiving the action you have the middle voice where the subject is involved in the action uh, and then you have the mood and the mood is the last letter on the verbs uh, and you have moods like indicative mood so indicative means indicating, which means it's telling a truth. It's a statement of fact. These men came from the east. That's what it's saying. It's a simple statement. They, they did come. <clears throat> um, you have different moods. Again, just getting into the verbs a little bit. You remember having the imperative mood. So you'd say to like a little child, come, come here. So the word come in the, you know, in the Greek, you'd put it in the imperative, vo an imperative mood. Or you could say, um, maybe he will come. You don't know. Is John coming tomorrow? Maybe he will come. So you put that in the subjunctive mood. So that's a possibility. Uh, and then you have the optative mood as well. So different other moods. I, I won't get into it too much. But uh, when you look at the um, you look at the verb, you have the verb. This is a, it's, it's a little bit awkward because in the aorist you have different kinds of aorists in the way that they're written. Uh, usually you wouldn't see the, the two in front. So this would be tense. You have three letters related to the verb. If you disregard the number, you have the tense, the voice, and then you have the mood. So tense, voice, mood. That's what you have in the, the basic verbs. Uh, and then it's third person plural. So we're not talking, that, you know, that, that we're not saying that the Pharisees is you. It's not you. We're not talking to you. It's not me. I'm not the one coming uh, east to Jerusalem, but it's them. So if, you, if ever you have to use the, the pronoun like they or them or he or she, this is talking about the third, uh, third person. And it's in the plural because there's a whole group of them coming. And again, it could be up to 100 people. Uh, now the verb here, it's a little bit awkward again because you have the word paragenonto and that's the form, the basic form. And remember the basic verb form is always present, active, indicative. In your Greek dictionaries, it's going to be in the present tense, be the active voice and the indicative mood. P-A-I, if you can remember that. Uh, but in the basic form is paragenomai. Um, if you break down the verb form, which they will do here, that they show you in the dictionary. Again, I'm using the e, uh, I'm using the eSword software, which you could have on your phones or your computers. Para means alongside. Genomai means to come into existence or to become, usually, or to uh, yeah, usually means to become. Uh, but in this case. Uh, it's a little bit awkward because you can see the meaning of the word paragenomai here can mean to become near or to approach uh, or to appear, to come or to go, which sounds like the opposite. You know, you're coming or you're going. What, what, what is it? Uh, or to be present. So you just have to look at the, um, uh, to look at the context. Uh, the word come actually, or, or to come or came in the Greek, they have other words. I think elthon is another one that appears a lot. And um, uh, I can't remember off the top of my head right now, but there's a few words for to go and to come and things like that. But in this case, they're using the word paragenomai, 
but because it's not the present active indicative, we're talking it's in the second aorist deponent indicative, the, the form changes uh, and it becomes paragenonto. But you can sort of see it's, it's, it's similar in, in the Greek. It, it has changed a lot, but again, it, again, it depends on the ending. So. Uh, so that's the verb. So you have the subject, the magi, or the, uh, magi they came. Uh, and that would be a complete sentence, the Magi came. You could put a full stop on that, but then the writer, Matthew, goes on to say they came into Jerusalem. Ace as a preposition just means toward, it can go uh, to go towards, to in, enter. They entered, you could even say they entered Jerusalem. Uh, and again, the preposition Ace is with the word uh, Jerusalem, and Jerusalem takes on the, uh, the accusative singular feminine form okay but then you know, I'm just going through this just to give you some more concepts in the Greek and I know you want to get away from the and you know, just looking through the grammar books and get into reading the Bible in Greek so hopefully that helps um, any questions so far Pastor Dim yes John. just to, just to clarify Magoi is different from uh, King right Magoi is a word from what, sorry? Magoi is different from uh, king. That's correct, yes. Yeah, Ma Magoi yes. is the wise man. Because oh, man. Here, man. here in the Philippines, uh, I don't know, maybe because of the tradition, uh, we have uh, the uh, celebration for uh, three kings. Oh. Uh, it happens... Uh, in the first and second day of the of the Janu month of January, so it's not supposed to be three kings, right? Ah, uh, yeah, that's right. And actually, you just reminded me because there's a song we call it. You know, um, it says when I was a kid, we learned as we um, we three kings of Orient are bearing gifts we traverse afar. So actually, in the, there's a song which talks about the three kings, and they, they mean the Magi. Um, I haven't sung that song for many years, but that, that's wrong. You should not, they, they're not kings. They're certainly not kings. That's entirely incorrect, right? In, uh, completely incorrect, that's correct, yeah. So, yeah, just, just disregard that. Uh, next time, if you're singing the song or you have the celebration, you just tell people that you know, it's not the kings, it's the holiday of the three, well, it's not, not even the three kings. Again, we don't know how many, right? So they got the number wrong, and then they got the, the title of the people wrong as well. Is, is that like a national holiday, did you say? Yes, yes. It happens uh, first and second day of, uh, of the year. Of the year. January. But January 3rd? January 1, January 1, 2, and uh, sometimes even January 3. Yeah. No. Oh, okay. It's a national holiday. Wow. Okay. Well, that's Catholic, I think. Yeah, that's funny because it's a national holiday. It's, it's completely built, and, and they probably got it from you know, the book of Matthew, but um, they certainly interpreted it compl completely wrong. But just. Uh, and Pastor Tim, yes. Follow up question. Uh, the, it was not specifically uh, implied there that the, there were just three, right? It That's was uh, uh, Magi's from the East. Mm -hmm. So could, could be many. Oh, yes. Yeah, as I was uh, explaining just now, it could be up to 100 people. You, know? mm -hmm. uh, but you had the, the Magi, and, and they, they, as almost like aristocracy maybe, but very academic people, they weren't just three guys on a camel, you know, on, on three camels. Uh, there was a whole faculty of yeah. people coming from uh, possibly somewhere near Babylon, actually, or Parthia. Parthia in those days, that's the ancient sort of the, uh, Babylonian or ancient Persia. Um, yeah, but, and, and they could have come even from, you know, they could have been based in different cities and they all, they, they arranged to come together and then they traveled together from their individual cities or towns that they came through in, in Parthia. In the old days of Parthia, and then they, they met up at some place and then they traversed along the Euphrates River. They would have traveled along the Euphrates River 
and then down through the Levant, uh, you know, possibly following the Jordan River or down the coast to Jerusalem. Yeah, I agree, Kay. If you would be traveling just the three of you at that time, considering their gifts, uh, that would be in danger of the robbers. <laughs> right. Yeah, they, they probably wouldn't have made it. Uh, that God could have protected them, of course, but they, these people had common sense and they would have traveled with a security detail as well. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Um, we can stop there. If you'd like to carry on, we can do one more verse. So I prepared the next verse. So if you, would you like to do that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's do Matthew chapter 2, verse 2. We'll just go through this one. Uh, take another 10 minutes or so. <clears throat> Um, so in the second verse, it says, they were saying, where is he who is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Uh, now, so it starts off in the Greek. And we'll just look at the, the concept here. It says, Ado men. Now, we've seen that in the first person plural in our studies, uh, in the verb. Now, this is a verb. But they put on the verb endings, you get an, uh, the indication of how many people. Is it singular or is it plural? And omen in the verb tells you that we're talking about not just one person. Okay, so the, and, and, But it's the first person because they're speaking. They're saying we. So omen is we. For example, if you said um, blepo, you can say I see the star, astera. You say uh, blepo. Ton astera, I see the star, or you can say we we see the star, blepo men. In that case, be blepo men, we see the star. In this case, it's in the aorist tense again because it's a past event. So the word, um, and this is the word hora, or actually the word we have blepo to see, but hora is another verb for see. So this is. And Edelman, uh, the, the word C actually, the, the form changes quite dramatically uh, from the, the normal form. Uh, but horao, horao is the, the root form here, but again, it's going to change a lot uh, just for this specific word. But Edelman literally means we have seen. And that's how they translate we have seen here. Um, and that's second aorist active indicative. Active meaning that they're the ones doing the action, they're the ones that are seeing the star, and indicative is a statement of fact. So if you see the word, the letter I after the verb, it's always going to be a statement of fact, even though it might not be true, but the person that is saying that believes it is true. So that's something else we have to consider. Like, you know, somebody can say, um, you know, you ask a little child and you say, um, how old are you? And yeah, children, sometimes they can't remember their ages very well. You might say, I am three years old. And maybe he's actually four years old. Uh, but, but that sentence will be a statement of fact because he believes that's true. Okay, so if, if it's a statement of fact or believed to be true or for the concept we're talking about, we have to understand that the, the speaker uh, says this is truth. Uh, that's a, a statement of fact and it's in the indicative. But these, these people, they have seen the Magi we have seen uh, his star. Now the word gar is a word you see many, many times as well in the New Testament. It's probably one of the most common words that you'll find. Uh, and it appears a lot. It just means for or because or therefore. Uh, and the reason you see it a lot in Scripture is because the Scripture is always explaining things. You know, because of this or for this reason. You know, so you often see the word gar. It's just three simple letters, but it, you know, it does appear so many times, uh, and it's a conjunction. Okay, so we, but here they translate as for. You could say, be, you know, because we have seen, for example. Uh, now the word our two is usually just translated his. Okay, and here literally we just see his. It's capitalized because we're talking about Jesus Christ. For we have seen his, and then you have. Ton astera, and ton. Uh, now this is a uh, that's the article, and it's in the accusative singular masculine. 
and then you have the word austera. Now, austera is a word for star. It's, it's actually a masculine noun, but it has the feminine ending. Okay, so this is this is where it gets confusing. Even I still get confused a lot because you can have a, a, a masculine noun, it can have a neuter ending or a, ma a feminine ending. But what's going to help is if there's an article that'll tell you. Okay, so the article tells you, oh, this is a masculine noun. Um, and T is the word for article. If you see T on the front here, <coughs> uh, that means it's an article. So the star, we have seen the star. Uh, and you know, we have seen his, but because we say his, we have the pronoun here. We don't normally put the article with the uh, with the noun following the, the possessive pronoun. If we didn't have the word his, we would say he, we have seen the star. But again, we have the word our true. It's the genitive. Okay, genitive pronoun here is P. So again, it'd be his, her, um, his book, her book, my book, my, M-Y, my is, uh, is the possessive pronoun, your book, our book. Okay, we have these possessive pronouns in English, and it's the same in the Greek, in this case, his. So they're actually saying this is, this is the star of Jesus Christ. It's a special star that God has put into history, God has put into space uh, to show the birth of Jesus Christ. Uh, for we have seen his star, and where was it? En te anotole, in the east. And that's where they came from. You know, they're saying they came from the east. Uh, and the word te, and here is the article again. It's, in this case, the article takes on the dative singular feminine form. Because the noun anotole is in the dative singular feminine form and always the article is going to match with the noun just like we have the word ton astera see accusative singular masculine asm it has to match with the noun if it doesn't match that it means you're looking in the wrong place for the article maybe the noun is somewhere else in the sentence because the article and the noun can be separate and you can have a whole lot of words in the middle uh, and sometimes you, you can have the article and there's no noun. In that case, it's what we call a relative article. Okay, so um, I'll give you some examples in, in later lessons. But if you see the article, and it's just an article without a noun, uh, really we just relate, we can often uh, translate as that or that which was something like that. But it becomes a relative, a relative noun or even I think they call it a relative article. Okay, so um, just you know, just to explain that first phrase there, for we have seen his star in the east. So you have the noun, and the noun here is you know the the we attached. Oh, sorry, that's actually the verb, but you have the uh, the, the word we. Uh, and actually, when you look at it in the Greek, we should look at this as a complete. This is the one word we have seen. Uh, and I said we we have the noun, but actually the noun appears in the verb. So. Literally, you take that, that verb phrase, we have seen, and this is put into one word in the Greek, men. For, that, that matches with the gar. So for, uh, we have seen. So if you take the, the last part of the noun, this is the we here, the, oh, oh sorry, omen, and eido from the word horao, which is the, the basic Greek verb form, men. We have seen. His, our two, ton astera, the star. But we just say his star, en te anatole, which means in the in the east. Okay, and then just to complete it, actually we say kai uh, el thomen. Okay, and now I mentioned just now that the word el then, uh, el then, sorry, is the basic Greek uh, form of the word come as well. It's another word for come. So this is a different word, but kai el thomen. See, again, you have the word omen, we have come. Uh, and then now we have, a, we've never had this before, but this is what you call a infinitive. Infinitive we have in English, like, uh, he has come to the sea to swim, or he has come to class to study. So often we have the word infinitive is the word to worship, and this is actually a verb. You translate as to worship here, uh, and often so, you know, to, uh, well, this is an infinitive form. Even in English, we call it infinitive. 
Uh, and the word is from the word proskoneo, which means to worship, but here it's proskonesai. And that puts it into the infinitive form, which is, um, they say it's a verb, but it's, uh, really it's like a noun form of a verb, to worship. Because the word worship is a noun, uh, like, you know, we've come to, work to the beach to swim. Um, or f for swimming, I guess. Sometimes that sort of, or to learn even. Uh, and, and words like learn and swim, they can be nouns and they can be verb forms as well. But in that case, it's called an infinitive. Uh, so if you want to do some studies about that, you can look up the, the words, uh, what an infinitive is, if you're not sure about that, and look at the examples. Okay, so just to complete it again, Eidomen ga altru ton astera en te antole kai el fomen proskunesai alto. Saying, where is he born? Oh, we just have this part here. So, for we have seen his star in the east and have come uh, to worship alto him. And the data form, there should be an, an iota subscript hanging off the bottom because it's in the data form and the software doesn't show that, unfortunately. Uh, but if you just imagine the iota subscript here, that would be to worship toward him, really, literally saying toward him. Okay, so I think that, that finishes off today. So we had a, a fairly good Greek lesson, you know, a tiny, got quite a few concepts. We got to read through a couple of verses in scripture. Uh, I do recommend, uh, I'll, I'll post this video online uh, on YouTube, but also if you do have Greek Bible software and you're reading through Max's lessons, uh, we've got the Greek alongside the English. So just even if you don't understand it, just practice reading the Greek, uh, which would help you get familiar with the words as well. Okay, anybody got any questions before we finish off? So, uh, Pastor Tim. Uh, yes, Pastor Ferry. Uh, by the way, I just got uh, having hardship because uh, uh, I cannot listen uh, uh, carefully because we are just on traveling. I just want to know, uh, do we have a, an assignment here in this group? Uh, what I'll do is... Um... I have to have a look at that actually because what I really would like you to do is to review. We're just okay. coming up to the end of, again, it's lesson five. And before we start off the new term, I want to make sure we've got these concepts uh, properly. And we, we sort of finished off to the last examples in lesson five, it was. And I don't really want to move into lesson six right now. Uh, but let, let me have a think about that, and I'll, I'll sort of look through the last tests that you had and, and what we might need to, to work on. Uh, but I think for now, you know, really the homework should just be reviewing the notes that we've done so that you're ready to go on to Lesson 6 when we start the new term. Um, okay, thank you so much, Pastor Tim. Okay, but, but let me think about that because we probably should have some homework, but I'll, I'll see what I can put together over the next couple of days. Okay, we will just wait. Okay. Uh, but as for the other classes, uh, you know, what we had, the other um, assignments, as you see listed here, uh, I'll post those up into, <clears throat> um, if it's the Grace Notes, I can post those straight into the Messenger. And then for the Matthew and Doctrinal Terminology assignments, I'll give those to Pastor John, and then over the next couple of days, he can put those into the Google Forms. Pastor Tim, is it okay if uh, I post it also in uh, in the messenger, even if uh, uh, we don't have the answer yet, since uh, I'm going to answer it first, is it yeah. if I post it, so that they can answer it, and if they can answer it, although they can view the score, but later okay. we edit the Google form, uh, putting the answers there, then they can view the answers. Yep, that's fine, yeah. That's good. We can do that. Okay. Um, okay, so I think that's it for now. So let's just bow our heads and we'll finish off with a closing prayer. 
Father, sir, we give thanks to you for your word, uh, for every opportunity that you give us to study your word, for the time and the resources that are required. Uh, we give thanks for your faithfulness in these things. And I uh, just pray that you keep encouraging us. Some of the work is, is quite difficult. It can be time consuming. Uh, you, we pray that you would help us to prioritize our time uh, and to keep us well motivated, to keep encouraging us knowing that through these studies, uh, through discipline and focus, and with correct motivation and humility, uh, that we can come to a state of maturity in order that we might glorify you. And so we give thanks for these things. In Christ's name, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Tim. Pastor Tim. Thank you, Pastor Tim. Okay, Thank you, Pastor Tim. Bye bye. Good night, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. Okay. Um, I'll leave the, the Zoom open for a while. I'll just turn off the uh, the recording and then you can all chat as you 